so we have to follow that, I guess. Um, it's going to be a challenge. I'm glad that Tanya stayed to listen to the white guys talk, so that's good. Um, so this is a, a, a panel of um, historians or people who've written historical works, and so um, we were going to kind of talk about maybe a, a really kind of traditional way of documenting punk, I suppose, in that sense, and some of the issues and challenges surrounding it. And I think we're going to try to touch on um, some of the other ideas from the first panel, from the second panel. Uh, there was actually some interesting stuff that came out there that we were planned on talking about, and I think uh, hopefully there'll be a good um, kind of continuation. So who wants to? You're the boss. <laughs> well, why don't you? You're sure. right here. The, we don't have to move sure. the microphone very far. Got to put this between us. Here we go. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Dewar McLeod, um, historian, and uh, I wrote a book called Kids of the Black Hole, Punk Rock in Post-Suburban California. And um, one of the things we were talking about and thinking about for this question is the sort of role, the personal role of, of the scholar as a, as a human and maybe as a punk or someone with the interest in punk um, and, uh, and how that plays in. And, and in, in my case, I started this uh, in grad school. And um, as far as I know, no other sort of working professional historian had written about punk. A lot of smart people had written historically informed good works on punk, but nobody who had a sort of professional engagement as, as, a, as a historian in training. Um, and so I started there and, uh, you know, I was, I was going to do something very different. And, um, you know, I woke up one day and I just, this, this idea came into my head. And I was taken with Lisa's comment earlier about she had no desire to historicize punk, and, and I did from very early on. And I, I even remembered that, you know, we're talking about you found a letter from yourself. I have a, a zine article I wrote where I went to Southern California. I was living in Northern California and went to see the Circle Jerk sort of in the middle of Orange County. And, you know, the hardcore scene was exploding, and there was a whole lot of talk about all the sort of jocks were taking over and kind of stuff like this. So I wrote a report, like, as a, you know, as a college student, young sociologist visiting. And I was already into to punk and, 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 and uh, other strange musics and strange culture. Um, but I was going to quote myself in my book as sort of a, as this is an archival document. And uh, I sort of chickened out and decided not to. But, um, but you know, so I, in grad school, I certainly was not. I actually went to grad school like, like this, but with a top button button. Like, I was like, I'm an adult now. And look, I got proof. And, um, but when I came up with this topic, you know, I had to run the gauntlet. And, you know, in the historical profession at the time, um, historians did not, you know, value pop culture. I got literally, wasn't this just a fad and things like that. Um, but there was also a real movement within academia of cultural studies, which was really influential to me. And maybe I'll get into some of the sort of uh, methodological questions about that. So I had this, you know, sense of like le for professional legitimation. I did not want to be, you know, identified in any way with this. But I also, for sort of scholarly detachment, kind of had that idea, you know? And I think it is a legitimate question about how do we sort of embrace our topics of study. You know, every Civil War historian writing about the Battle of Chickamauga is a fan of whoever the general who, who was, uh, you know, um, but they don't say so, right? Um, but, you know, in punk, you're not supposed to be. But one of the reasons I chose hardcore was because, and I actually used the Joe Carducci quote, I think twice in my book, which is, there's always been lousy rock and roll, but not until hardcore was there a, a fad for it, you know? And, um, and I wanted to write about hardcore because it was, you know, I didn't want to get into the question of whether it had aesthetic merit, whether any of these bands deserved any artistic sort of uh, uh, praise, or they deserved their place in the, in the rock and roll pantheon, right? And those are legitimate questions. I, partly for my, as I say, professional reasons, I didn't want to get into that, but I also didn't for my historical reasons, because I was really interested, you know, when I woke up that day, I, I saw punk rock very much as a historical phenomenon, um, and I saw it in the context of the histories of mass culture, and that was shifting in the 70s, and mass culture was being replaced and was fragmenting, um, starting in the 70s and into the 80s. History of youth culture, which sort of peaks in with the, the baby boom, with the counterculture of the 60s, and again starts to shift and fragment and change in the 70s. And also the history of suburbia, which again is shifting, and the sort of 
uh, white picket fence bedroom communities by the 70s are being replaced by these multinucleated metropolitan regions as, it, as, the, as the census data discusses them. And so that hardcore punk in Southern California was, was a part of all of those histories. So that's what I set out to do. And I was also trying to write a narrative that people would enjoy reading. I was trying to put in um, you know, some of the sex, drugs, and rock and roll that people want to read about. Um, and, and then um, I wanted to, uh, so I, I had a whole range of sort of cultural studies methodologies, but, but I know you didn't want me to talk a lot to start, and so we can make a, more of a discussion, but, but I wanted to capture, and, and I, I'm using this as the, you know, the Lydia lunch, like the smells of punk rock. You know, for me, what was interesting was, was punk rock as a daily life phenomenon, how people lived it, how people experienced it. So, I, you know, I wrote about the origins in LA and, you know, uh, and, and who started it there, but I really didn't want to focus on the geniuses and the, the, the creative ones. I wanted the, the latecomers, the posers, the, the jocks who were pretending on weekends and those kinds of, or the people who just were sort of tangentially went to some shows, absolutely identified with it, read the zines, bought the music, but you never heard of them, as, as we were, as you know, as the last panel talked a lot about. And um, I was really, so I was interested in, as a, as a social history phenomenon there. Um, and, uh, and again, not because, you know, the other questions aren't important, but I do think that, uh, and I think this might lead, you know, the sort of political aspect of what punk becomes is, is complicated, you know, it's, it can't be divided by a sort of left-right divide, and um, it's certainly different in each scene, but also how we carry the impact of punk, right, how people identify as punks, I'm a poser up here as an academic, but I'm really, and what does that mean to be 35, to be 53, and to get up and still carry the legacy of punk, and, you know, to me, I, I think that's where the, um, the political impact of punk in the longer term is creating generation and generations of approaches to the world um, that, that, you know, as you know, Lydia Lunch embodies, right? We may all not all embody it so embodied as she does, but, uh, but those values, you know, resonate. And, you know, the open question is how, you know, how and to what end? So I'll, I'll stop there for now, but, uh, you know, then we'll, we'll talk some more. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Mike Fournier. I teach English at Holyoke Community College. I wrote the 45th installment of the 33 and a third series on Double Nickels on the Dime, uh, the Minutemen album from 1984. I have two novels out on Three Rooms Press. Uh, in 1987, my parents moved with me, moved from uh, suburban Boston to Concord, New Hampshire. Right? My grandparents were uh, chicken farmers who were put out of business by factory farming and New Hampshire has no income tax, right? It just has property tax. So over a number of years to pay off their bills, uh, my grandparents would find the shittiest chunk of their land and would donate it to the state of New Hampshire to some uh, wildlife refuge or something like this. Uh, then, and, and they'd like totally give the state of New Hampshire the finger while they were doing that. And then ultimately they gave my parents some land and, uh, so as like a 13 year old kid with huge glasses and braces and a face full of whiteheads, I was totally isolated, right? And uh, I didn't know how to deal with that. I went to a new school first and uh, I found a skateboard magazine in the library where I would hang out by myself because the people would leave me alone in the library during lunchtime. And all of these skaters had all of these punk rock stickers on their boards. So. Uh, I remember there was this one Saturday where my mom uh, had to go shopping before church. So she dropped me off and I like went to the comic book store and I like scraped together my allowance and bought the first Sex Pistols tape because I had seen their logo on all these skateboards. And uh, we went home so that we could put on our church clothes. And like by the time I got out of the shower, I had about five minutes before we were ready to go. So the first song on the Sex Pistols album is Holidays in the Sun. So for the duration of church, I was trying to figure out why this guy who couldn't sing was the singer of a band, right? So like, so the idea then uh, just totally consumed me, right? So instead of going to the library and trying to like, you know, sort of escape detection for a while, 
uh, I started going to the library and I started trying to dig up as much information about this band as I could. I started learning how to uh, use microfilm. I started tracking down everything. And of course, like the only information in 1987 uh, about the Sex Pistols was coming from like Rolling Stone magazine, right? Uh, but it was a start. It was totally a start. And uh, every little scrap that I found was really valuable, right? From there, uh, I started going to the few shows that were in Concord, New Hampshire, but the punk rock that made its way to Concord, New Hampshire uh, sounded like either Slapshot or Wrecking Crew, right? Two big Boston bands at the time who reminded me of the kids that would threaten to beat the shit out of me at school, right? Except they had like shaved heads instead of using a lot of product like all the football players did. So I didn't feel like there was any place for me because like I knew that there was this like, there was this alternate thing that was happening. There was this alternate history, but you know, the, uh, the accessible bunch of kids that I was around that I could have gone to their shows just like still struck me as the same thing, just wearing a different shirt or something like this. Um, two things then happened afterwards. Uh, Lisa said something about history being complex and contradictory, right? Right after I moved to New Hampshire, I went to France for a month on exchange. And stupidly, I only brought one book with me. So I wound up reading the same book three times in a row. And it was The Wicked Ways of Malcolm McLaren, right? And uh, that book by Craig Bromberg, if memory serves, totally contradicted all of the stuff that I had read in Rolling Stone magazine about the Sex Pistols. I was like, holy shit. You know, that was the first inkling that there was, uh, that in addition to being some other scene, that there was a complete different narrative, right? So that made me dig even harder. And uh, the other thing that happened is I start, my dad bought a second VCR, right? So that meant that any videotape that anyone brought home, I could tape and I could have it myself, right? So that was a revelation because I could put six skateboard videos on one VHS tape. And I was super stoked about that. Santa Cruz uh, had a lot of SST stuff, right? So it's through the streets of, streets of fire, right? Not wheels of fire. Streets of fire uh, video that, that was the one with Jason Jesse in prison um, that I found out about all the SST stuff that I found out about the Minutemen, right? The first time I heard Paranoid Chant, I was so relieved that there was a punk band that was funny. You know, there was a punk band that was like, that had an active sense of humor that wasn't just like barking at me about how I should get that beer away from me or something like this. Uh, so then the obsession became the Minutemen for me, except uh, the stuff, the information about the Minutemen wasn't terribly accessible in Concord, New Hampshire, pre-internet in 1987, 1988. Uh, Ozrod's book comes out in 2001, Our Band Could Be Your Life, and then uh, Keith and Tim's movie We Jammy Kano about the band comes out right around 2004. And the entire time, it was obvious to me that the Minutemen were a band that were speaking their own language. You know, they had their own, like, specific dialect, and I knew that all the songs on Double Nickels, which was my favorite album, were about something. But no one had ever said what those songs were about. You know, in all the years that people wrote about that band, certainly there was a well-established narrative. You know, I understood that, you know, part of the reason uh, the band was valuable is because they had their own style. You know, punk is whatever we make it to be. They were totally operating under that. There wasn't like the, the certainly there wasn't the hardcore Boston orthodoxy, which scared the shit out of me and still does today in some ways. Uh, and they, they were having fun, they were friends, they had a sense of humor, but nobody really wrote about the music that I could find. So when I discovered the uh, 33 and a third series, it was, it was obvious to me, it was inevitable to me that somebody had already done all that work and nobody did. So I, uh, I bullshitted them <laughs> in my pitch. I told them that Mike Watt was gonna help me and I told Mike Watt that I had a book contract. Mm -hmm. And I've never done anything like that before or since, but it worked. And then through, uh, through talking to Watt, I found out what the jokes were behind all those songs, which is really what I wanted, was to know what the jokes were behind everything. Um, so in terms, of, uh, in terms of documenting punk, right, I guess for me, um, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult for me to separate the, the personal. You know, I think that there's gotta be some personal connection, I, and you know, I respect, uh, academia, I taught a punk rock history course at Tufts for a little bit, uh, and I tried to be as objective as possible, but you know, my start in this is all because uh, 
you know, because a bunch of music made me feel like I wasn't totally isolated. So I think that that personal part is really important for me. So thanks. Any questions? <laughs> what do you want? You want well, I, I, I think that was one of the questions that I wanted to explore a little bit uh, in more detail, perhaps, is that, you know, that um, uh, Lydia was saying that her she her job or her uh, sense of it was she was documenting her own personal psychoses, but as a as a historian, um, that's kind of not our job. Uh, it's not in the job description so much. And so I wondered about that tension, because obviously, uh, punk and the music and it was very personal to both of you. And I just wondered about how you deal with that tension, maybe between. Um, the sort of demands of the job, as it were, and, the de and then the demands of, of being a fan or a, a participant. I, I could phrase this kind of in a slightly different way, maybe, too, this might help, is that I, when I was in graduate school, I knew a, a guy who was a, um, I was in the history department, but he was in the philosophy department. But he knew more about World War II than anyone I think I've ever met. And I said, why are you in the philosophy department? Why aren't you, you in the history department? And he said, because if I studied World War II like a historian, it would ruin it for me. Mm -hmm. So it, it, there was something in the way that he, um, I don't know if consumed is the right word, but the way he interacted with the history of World War II that he felt would be kind of ruined by, um, by applying an academic lens to it. And so I wondered if you all had thought about that and maybe, again, about sort of those tensions. Good. Um, yeah, uh, it doesn't ruin it for me. That's why I'm an academic, you know. But I, uh, I always regret the, uh, you know, if you read even the bio here, it says uh, I'm a participant. And, and, you know, I'm far more comfortable now with my place, my own personal place. And I even have a punk rock band, which you can all, you know, go on Facebook and see and stuff. Um, but... But I wasn't really a participant. I saw some of it, and I have my three stories. I told Byron one of them already. You know, I, I, I have a Jello story, and you know, I have like three stories. And, but I, and I saw some great bands, and I read some great zines, and listened to a lot of great stuff. And you know, I have my conversion experience, which, which I talk about in my book of going to see Led Zeppelin, you know, way up in the stadium, and then going to see the Ramones, and literally standing, leaning on the stage in front of Johnny Ramone at 15 years old, you know, at the Whiskey A Go Go. And uh, I wish this next part of the story was, you know, I formed a band the next day and all that kind of stuff. I didn't. I went back. I was a, you know, a, a wannabe surfer, not yet a wannabe punk. And I didn't get it. You know, it was too scary. It, was old, it did seem older to me at the time, you know. They, they, most of the people were in their 20s, I think. But for various reasons, it didn't feel like it was there. It was for me. And, and a few years later, I still listened to music, and I still, I would read the, like, Slash magazine, like, you know, as, a, as a, again, a long-haired suburban kid, I'd go into, I think it was Licorice Pizza or Music Plus in L.A., and I'd buy these, and I'd read cover to cover, because I didn't know about any of it. And, and, you know, one of the themes is, you know, for me is, and, and it definitely it did affect my approach, because I, that's why I was interested in the people kind of like me, who were not the people necessarily at the center of the story, but I, I you know, as I, as I was looking back and thinking about it historically, I assumed that there was many others, you know, that there was many others who were coming in it, into it through their own, um, in their own ways. So, uh, and then it also opened up to me, you know, one of the historical questions that I find interesting is that for me, punk was the avenue into the rest of the world. It became a filter. So, you know, Lydia was talking about forced exposure, right? I'd read about stuff. Slash was originally for me, but other places where I'd read about other bands. I, you know, I, I, I learned about rockabilly through that. I learned about surf music through that. I learned about blues. I learned about anarchism. I learned about anti-imperialism. I learned about feminism very deeply through, through punk. At least it, the beginning of those of, of, of those questions. And I suppose I could have done that through Pink Floyd and Genesis or found my world as people do through other cultures. But so that's why I'm interested in um, in the questions of how do how do we use this stuff? Historians talk about culture, sort of does culture shape who we are or does it reflect who we are, right? And the short answer of course is it's both. And but how? You know, how does it how does it shape us? How are we all brainwashed by the mass media, right? But how are we all not brainwashed by mass media, right? Um, and that's as, that's as equally important. And, and you can do that with pop cult, popular culture, but you can do it also with unpopular culture, as Lisa called it, which is, you know, do subcultures work differently, 
because um, we're all, you know, if you're plugged into a subculture or a set of them. Uh, and then finally, the, you know, the sort of net, one of the themes earlier, and, and you know, Byron, you talk about the time slips. I thought that was fascinating, right? Because the historian, how do these things get transmitted? And the question about, was there one zine article that changed your mind, you know, that, that spoke to you, right? Those are the kinds of things, how the nodes of connection with other ideas, other possibilities, and other people doing those strange, weird, freaky, creepy, whatever things that, that attract you, right? Or repulse you, right? So I, I feel like I've, I've trained, I've, I've proven your, my answer by uh, turning the personal into my academic, right? This is the way I, I, I was thinking. You know, in college I started reading you know, while going to see these bands, Greil Marcus, Simon Frith, Dick Hebdige, and, and as well as my, Byron Coley and Richard Meltzer, Kickboy Face, and people like that. And all that stuff's deeply, deeply intellectual um, in different styles, right? But for me, that, you know, the personal engagement with punk was always deeply intellectual. And, um, and I'll stop there for now. Yeah. Uh, Tanya was talking about the, uh, the imposter syndrome that you get when you sort of land in academia after doing other things for a long time. Um, prior to going to grad school, I waited tables for 10 years and I worked in record stores. Uh, so certainly I think that the, uh, you know, the imposter syndrome ties into the entire idea, you know, of like uh, historicizing punk. I don't think that punk rock is a monolith. I think we treat it like that, or we traditionally have treated it like that uh, for a long time because these uh, early narratives were established. Um, but now like, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm wide-eyed about this, but it seems, like, uh, it seems like that monolith is being destroyed and it seems like there's, uh, there's room for as many voices as, uh, as there are voices to be heard, which I think is fantastic. I do agree that um, it was a filter in some ways. You know, like before I, uh, before I really understood like the MC5, I had to go back and I had to figure out the 1968 Democratic National mm -hmm. Convention, which in turn made me go back and figure out the Black Panthers, who I wasn't taught about in school. So yeah, it's, it's totally a filter in some ways, too. Um, I guess when you were talking about voices, that kind of brought up another question I thought we might talk about a little bit, is that um, a lot of the books, as you said, there hasn't been a tremendous amount although that's changing in terms of academic work. And so a lot of it uh, tends to be rely almost exclusively on oral histories or interviews or people writing their own accounts, which of course is very much in keeping with the kind of ethos of doing it yourself. Um, but again, that poses some challenges to a historian uh, who's, uh, who wants to try to contextualize or um, you know, make broader um, implications, not even to mention some of the stuff that Byron said about, well, you know, there, there may be factual issues, shall we say, in some of these accounts. And I've, re I've noted, I noted, noticed recently, and we talked a little bit about this uh, earlier, that um, sometimes I think a lot of, the, especially the major figures in the punk movement, or at least those who are usually identified as that, have told the same stories uh, over and over and over again, and you wonder now if they've just become kind of a canned story rather than a kind of authentic um, documentation of, of the movement. And I don't know, maybe Tanya could talk about this too, if, if that's different for those people who haven't been um, included in the canon of, you know, punk gods, so to speak. Uh, so I just wondered if you um, had comments about those things. I love Ian Mackay, and uh, I understand <laughs> if you were 15 years old why you would want to interview him for your fanzine, but you know what you're going to get at this point, right? It's, uh, it's 2016, he's going to talk about music being a form of language uh, that predates actual language. You know, there's any, like, there's any number of canned answers that he has. God bless him, I, I love Ian Mackay and his contributions and stuff like this. Um, but you know, there's, there's still more questions to be asked. Um, Craig Ibarra, who is a, he was SST's uh, art director for a little while, just put together a history book called uh, A Wailing of a Town, which is a San Pedro history. And uh, since 1985, nobody had asked Linda Kite in print what happened the night that she was driving the van that she was in when Dee Boone was killed, right? 
And so for, what, 30 years, people have been like actively shit-talking her because the narrative was that she fell asleep, right? Because she was in such shock that she was like, oh, I must have fallen asleep. And then she, uh, you know, since then she's figured out that she was in such shock that she blacked out the trauma of the axle of the Dodge van that they were driving, snapping, right? So, um, you know, like certainly there's like the well-grooved narratives and, you know, there's like, you know, not to take away from any 15-year-old kid who wants to interview Ian MacKay or anybody like that, but, you know, we, we have to keep asking questions. You know, we have to keep approaching stuff from new angles. Um, yeah. Good. Um, yeah, uh, there's definitely, I have a lot of trouble. I, have, I did not enjoy doing the interviews with my book. I didn't do a lot. And I didn't do it well, I think, was first of all. First of all, every time I, I ask all these questions, and I realized the tape was on pause and things like that, so I just physically wasn't, wasn't good at it. But, you know, I, oftentimes I knew more than what they knew, which was sometimes good. I, I'd done my homework. And, um, you know, questions, when I'd ask specific questions, what happened this day, those were the best, because then you can bring different perspectives in. But... Even those I had, you know, I, I have a section about this famous Elks Lodge riot um, at, uh, um, in March 1979 in L.A. And I was actually there for some reason. And, uh, and I wasn't, you know, fully, it wasn't part of the scene at all, but I was there. So I had my own eyewitness account. And I interviewed people, and I found their, their memories to be very unreliable. Um, one guy told me a story that, you know, we were drinking in the park across the street, and um, so when the cops and riot gear all showed up as helicopters, we ran across the street to get, grab our bottles so we could fight it out with the cops. And we got there, and um, the, the bottles were all gone. So they must have cleared it out in knowing that the battle was coming. And I just thought that just defied belief. And without corroboration, I couldn't have it. Another guy told me he's, he was on the stage, and uh, you know when it happened, and they pulled the plug, he's, he said that he thought his manager had called the police because um, for a publicity stunt. And, and that's believable, but I didn't have any other corroboration. So that was one, one case. Um, but the, wor the harder part was sort of what, was, what did punk rock mean to me? And what is punk, you know, why did I become a punk? And, you know, uh, as, as I say, you know, punk for me is often an intellectual endeavor, and I find that's the case for a lot of punks, and that they thought about this for decades now. And so while the answers may be canned, the other part is that they're, they're thoughtful, right? And they, they've been rewritten over the years to, you know, to include, oh, now I understand what I was like when I was 15. Now I know what I was doing. And those are useful, potentially, right? But they don't get you really where the kid was when, when he or she was 15, right? So that was a challenge for me. And the zines do that better, right? Especially the letters and such. The d zines do that better. Um, but for the, you know, the, the sort of marginalized voices, right, that were there and contributing, but maybe haven't been interviewed as much and haven't been uh, uh, as, as actively sort of um, pursued, obviously those voices need to get, because, cause, you know, I, I look now even at my own book and I look back at some of the people that, some of the stuff that's right there in front of me, I didn't really get, you know, and it was there, I talked about it. I gave that person whatever credit, and I wasn't really interested in giving credit, but that person, that, that phenomenon is there, but I, it's not as rich and as deep as I, as I wish it were, you know? And, and some of that could have been if I'd been able to ask better questions or talk to different people. Some of it was if I'd been able to think about it more, you know, in, more, more thoroughly in a more nuanced way. And some of it is that there are other voices coming out, and the, the LA, so Southern California scene is getting, you know, the, the, the work on that. Um, and the people who are con contributing to that conversation has gotten stronger. I think, you know, Byron mentioned that people aren't throwing stuff away the way they used to. And when I started this, I can't tell you how many times people said, oh, I just threw all my stuff away yesterday, kind of those kinds of stories, you know, because it had no value. And a lot of those people had disappeared. And a lot of them have come back, I think, in the last 10, 15 years, realized that, you know, we can get, go back on the road because people want to pay us and people want to hear us. Um, and, uh, you know, I know in L.A., a lot of those bands for that time are still, you know, still out there playing. So, uh, so I, I have a lot of, you know, doubts about oral history 
and um, I know you're probably, I don't know if you're going to talk about it, I know you, you're using a lot, and, uh, you know, I, I, it obviously needs to be done, but it's, it's, for me, I haven't figured out how to use it properly. Did you want to comment on that, or I don't want to put you on the spot. Um, no, I mean, I can also just go through, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can kick the table over any time you want. <laughs> yeah. You haven't done it yet, yeah. it's getting late <laughs> at the day. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll just open it up, I guess, to, folks and see if there are other questions that people have in the, yeah, in the back there. Um, so, uh, I'm coming from Southern California and I grew up listening to a lot of Southern California punk rock and I was recently watching Decline of Western Civilization and I was like, oh yeah, all this music that I like, grew up listening to. But then I sort of had that like moment of internal dissonance because there are those moments in the film where you see like the less savory aspects of some punk rock bands and like I think that you know in so many ways for a lot of us punk rock informs a lot of our values but then we're confronted with those other pockets of punk rock that are horrible like racist skinheads and whatnot and so I just was curious about like how as you know historians who are interested in documenting this in an academic way and in like an objective way but also as people who feel passionate about it and like connected to it, like how do you cope with that? Um. That's great. I, I just rewatched that, uh, and I watched a few other things. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was criticism of that movie when it came out by people in the scene, and I think there's so much great material in that movie. It's well worth seeing. That that I didn't, I wasn't as critical at the time. I was much more critical now. I think she really pathologizes the scene. It's not just the less savory stuff. You know, most of the people seem wasted. They seem stupid. They seem, you know, you know having a band like Fear up there, that was one of the bands, it was an important band, but without understanding, without some context, you get no sense of who these guys were. And they're, they're a joke band, they're sort of self-mocking, and you know, there's, there's this, and there's no nuance in there. So if you don't know anything about it, and this is your first document, you're gonna see, you know, what she wanted, which was this intense, sort of scary, yet, you know, attractive on some level scene. Um, so I, I find that, you know, it's disturbing and, and, I, and I, so I rewatched We Jam Econo, which is a Minuteman movie and, and a, just a beautiful movie and does, you know, really treats the subject with, uh, uh, with, with love and with dignity. Um, and I watched the X movie, um, The Unheard Music, and, and it treats them like, like X comes off like, Exine looks like an idiot. And I know she's said, you know, I don't, where she is now is another whole story, but she comes off as an, as an idiot. And, you know, when you see The Unheard Music, you see four creative artists. You may not like what they do, but they're, ta they're treated seriously as artists. And, and, you know, I was interested in that. For me, one of the things I loved was, like, talking, like, Tony and the adolescents, a 15-year-old kid, you know, you know, living on welfare in the suburbs, but he thinks he can be an artist by being, and by writing punk rock lyrics and being in a punk rock band. And punk rock is the only place where nobody said, no, you can't, right? Most of us put away art when, when you know, at some age in school, you're no longer an artist, now you have to do something else. And punk was these kids, and, and I love that maybe he wasn't a good artist. I don't really care, right, that these, that they were good. And, and then I do think there is, like, bands like X, I think, stand the test of time, who they were. The other side about the less savory, I, I, I would love to, this is the smell of punk rock, right? I would, you know, I would love to know more stories about who's screwing who and, 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 and how and why and what that was about, right? Not for the prurience, but because that's what they were doing, right? And that needs to be in there. What drugs were they taking? Right? That, and it's a, you know, in my book, I talk, I mention that stuff, but I don't have the way to really dive in, whether it was I didn't do the right research, ask the right questions, or I couldn't conceptualize it right. But I think that needs to be there, absolutely. Whether savory or not is not my, my perspective. It's that, you know, punk rock doesn't happen most places, you know, in my study without drugs, right? What drugs, when, where, how? Right? And that, need, that should be right up front. And sex is, it's not just sexuality, it's sex. And, and uh, what does that mean? And, and the, you know, it just, in terms of sexuality, the LA scene was interesting in terms of the early LA scene because my sense was, and, and Byron, maybe if you could correct me, was that the sexuality, and Lydia said it was all kind of open, but it was also not really spoken directly. That was a difference in the 70s. Although, you know, I'm not sure exactly if that's capturing it or not. But anyway, you might, you want to speak to that? It's funny that you mentioned this because I was in LA uh, last week and we were talking about decline last Saturday night. 
you know, and about specifically about how a lot of fears, jokes are at the expense of the LGBT community, right? And the, uh, you know, I think up until recently, the easy answer, like the pat answer, the privileged answer was just like, oh, it's a product of its time. You know, that's the answer that you give if you don't want to wrestle with it. And uh, increasingly, like, that pat answer has gone by the wayside. You know, I don't know what the answer is, but I know that, like, in conversation now, it's like, well, that was a product of its time, and that was fucked up, and what can we do now? You know, what can we do to try and change this? You know, that's, I wish I had a better answer for you, but that's like, you know, that's a, a recent product of discussion, uh, and it continues to be, you know? Because, like, as a fan, certainly, like, that was, you know, as a little kid, that was a, that was a movie that was uh, most easily accessible, aside from, like, maybe... Like something like 120 minutes or something like this. That was like it was a direct conduit to me, you know. Um, and it's it's sad, you know. It's sad to think that this like uh, touchstone, uh, this like really easily accessible movie, this touchstone, um, <laughs> is so gnarly and fucked up. You know, it's a drag. Uh, so you know, it's like when things are a, pro a product of their time. With air quotes, now it's like. I think now we can uh, we can have discussions about it and begin to hold stuff, you know, begin to hew, hold the humor, the, the fake bad humor, whatever, accountable. It's it's also. I feel like as someone who loves punk rock and who just like when your ears perk when you hear that phrase even but then for so many other people when the associations are like it's the same word and some people say it's the same culture and yet within it it's like you feel like completely opposite like it's so hard I think to have a, a conversation about both I feel like I don't know it's, yeah. yeah it's I mean like certainly it was uh Certainly John Brandon yelling negative approach is going to fuck you up on Saturday Night Live during Fear's uh, you know, aborted set was awesome, right? That was great. But at the same time, uh, you know, there's like, then there's the difficult conversation to have too. And it's, yeah, it's hard. There's, there's a definite schism. There's a definite split. And, uh, you know, it, it would be, you know, if it was easier, it would be easier. But it's, it's no longer easy in some ways. And that's what makes it a historical question, right? What is the product of its time? Well, that you know, you can you can say what that means. It's that phrase doesn't answer the question. That opens up. Well, what was it about the time? To me, the thing I, I kind of get fear. I know the shtick. It was shtick, and whether it was good or not, I understood how it worked. But including in the movie is what just you know bothers me more because it becomes the document, becomes the artifact, and it's completely, as I say, uncontextualized, unexplained. So you don't, you know, that's what surprised me rewatching it was how. Because um, I, when I saw it the first time when it came out, I understood what was going on. And watching it now as a historical document, you, nothing in the film explains to you what they're really trying to do, right? And uh, again, you may not like what they're trying to do, but it, it's much different. It comes off much different, I think. I think there was another, yeah. Um, so a question about sort of which disciplines are best equipped to be dealing with looking back at punk. I ask this as a music scholar because when I was getting into the punk scholarly literature, well, in general, I feel that a lot of music literature sucks the fun out of music, and especially so with punk. And the best example I saw in this was that a lot of things, they, a lot of articles, you, they talk about Bad Brains. They would say, Bad Brains is an important band because they were the first African-American punk band. Then I read something that was by an English scholar, so somebody who was writing for the experience of writing, who described what it was like at one of their shows and conveyed just how charismatic they were, how they carried the whole audience with them, and really gave a sense of why they were a big deal and it wasn't just the demographics. So can you talk a little bit about your different disciplines, what other disciplines might be bringing to this, and you know what each discipline might have to say that another one is not welcome to do? Uh, I'm a fiction writer, and no matter, like I finally wrote one book that didn't have uh, punk rock in it, but it had restaurants in it, right? So, and then like book number three, back to punk rock and restaurants. So I'm, I'm always using, um, you know, my experience, like my time in the scene, all in capital letters, 
uh, for fiction. Uh, I imagine that you could probably do some uh, some American Studies stuff. I think that would, that would probably work out. Uh, I don't play well enough to be an ethnomusicologist. Like I can play whatever your favorite polka song is on drums, uh, and maybe your favorite Ramon song on guitar if it's a ballad. Um, yeah, maybe those fields, I guess. So, great question. Um, uh, you know, my book is, is, I'm a historian and I like social history, and so uh, I'm influenced by, I was to talk to Byron, like, I'm not influenced by his writing. I couldn't even try, but, you know, so I love someone like Gril Marcus, who's a great writer. I know not everybody loves him, but I think he's a great writer. Even he, I'm a scholar and I'm interested in that. So there'll be, you'll, you'll be getting stories of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but then I'll say, but in order to understand this, you gotta understand the history of Los Angeles, and then I'll have some pages on that. And I know that some readers are like, oh, really? We don't care about that. We want, we want <laughs> the good stuff, right? Um, but, you know, the Bad Brains is the great example for me because um, I want you to tell me what that article you read because they're, for me, they're my Woodstock. Right? They're the kid thing I can tell my grandkids. I saw the Bad Brains multiple times, you know? And there was something no other band did what they did. And I saw Minutemen too, and they had, the, you know, I saw lots that I could say that, but B Bad Brains was, it's a great, perfect example. How do you capture, like, I, I never felt like the tape or the records captured, I never felt the videos that are on YouTube captured. There was something, and maybe good prose could, could approximate it, right? Um, but it's one of those things that, that, that it is exactly what I'm trying to, what I was trying to do is capture the dailiness. So I used a lot of different theories from cultural studies, in particular the, the theoretical work on the, the culture of everyday life, um, because that's what I was interested in. And, and I felt like in terms of Southern California, the politics was so diffuse that a directly kind of political uh, perspective, you know, it was, even with the Minutemen, their politics is really kind of libertarian or something like that, right? I, mean, I don't want to have a fist fight right now about that. I'll <laughs> can do that if you want. Only if we get to but, flip a table. Right? But, but, and I'll, I'll, Sarah, I'll see you in a second. I'll just, just, so, but I think that's exactly the kind of thing, like how, do, how does anybody capture the past, um, the richness of the detail, the smells of it, right? Uh, bodies flying everywhere, defying physics because the, mu the, the music seemed to levitate people off the ground and flying around the room and never experienced anything like it before or since, you know, so I can at least have that joy, uh, but, you know, it's hard to convey any, any of that, yeah. Sorry. answer that question, too. I think it's such a wonderful question, and, um, and I, you know, I wrote Girls to the Front. I, I deliberately decided not to go to PhD school to write it, and now I'm finishing a PhD to write a different book that I thought would work that way, and the thing is, I, in, in uh, researching Girls to the Front, I read a bunch of academic papers and master's theses and stuff that people had written on riot girl culture. Mm -hmm. And what I saw was that they did this, you know, and maybe this wasn't, maybe much of it wasn't particularly good uh, cultural studies or history work, but the culture was of use to, the, the, the culture was being put to use to um, prove some theory. You know, here's, Here's Bourdieu, and we know that Bourdieu is true because riot girl. And I thought, for this <laughs> culture, and for these cultural practitioners who've been sidelined and devalued since the minute they started making work and before, I wanna, what's the, the, what's the discipline that will give the cultural practice itself um, the dignity and the value as culture? And so maybe this is different talking about um, riot girl punk from other punk, you know, which by the time I'm starting to write this book in 2004, you know, guy punk or, you know, non-feminist, non-explicitly feminist punk has had 20 year, a 20 year head start, right? Um, and so now that I'm writing this other book from the position of a cultural studies scholar and in the English department and interdisciplinary humanities program, <coughs> I see how differently how, in, a, in a way, the, um, the discipline that I'm in now has to sort of always have the final word in what I'm writing now, and the great freedom of writing Girls to the Front as a, I was a journalist, a rock critic, you know, a, a, like, a trash can historian, you know, just like <laughs> pulling things together, whatever worked, was that I got to, um, to make central the experiences of the folks I was talking to and the culture that I made. And I don't know if I could have done that in a history department per se, certainly not as a, a um, 
journeyman history. Maybe it, it, you know, once I got more advanced. But it was a real question for me. Please. Um, if I could just make a plug for history here. Um, <laughs> There's a great book um, called History in Three Keys, um, which is about the Boxer Rebellion in China. And you're probably thinking, Why, what does that have to do with punk rock? But uh, three types of history, that's the three keys. And the first one is narrative history, which is kind of what we tend to normally think about what historians do. And the second one is history as lived experience, which I think captures some of that difference that you mentioned in terms of, or the smells, or what even Lydia Lunch was talking about in her documentation that it's kind of trying to capture a moment and that historians can't ever really recreate or recapture that sense of history as lived experience and we can kind of try. And then the last one is history as myth, um, which again I think has to touch on some of these things that we've talked about um, and maybe the exploring the dark areas kind of punctures that notion of history as myth um, and maybe some of the storytelling, the honed stories are kind of generating myths of a sort. So there is kind of room in history, I guess, for those three sorts of keys, and maybe punk rock would be a good, a good um, a candidate for that type of a, of a historical approach. Yeah, right. I, I had a fantasy, and not the wherewithal or ability, but to create a database of, you know, Southern California, just stick with that. Even just stick with Hollywood, the mask, the opening club, you could just, you know, take the first six months or something like that, of, from April 77 to the end of the year, and document every single person, right, who, who went to this record store, went to these sh one of these shows or something like that. You know, it's theoretically possible, right, and uh, not for one person necessarily to do it, and then theoretically possible to do it throughout, right, and then to gather. I wanted to ask all the sort of social history questions, right? Where did you live? What was the average income in those? What, what did your parents do? Were they married or divorced? Or what, all these kinds of social history questions to know who were these people. And then you try to do other questions that would come out the other end of who did you turn out to be, right? And because that's my kind of interest is, is the politics of punk, I think, is sort of who you turned out to be. When you were 15 and you discover punk alone in your room or alone at the mall or wherever, even if it's at Hot Topic in the mall or whatever, it, does it, is it just a, a thing, a blip that goes through or does it transform who you are? And, you know, theoretically those kinds of things are, are, are doable, right? Not, they were beyond my abilities, but, and, you know, it maybe takes the joy and the fun, right? That's, that's part of it and, and I'm aware of that, right? Because, um, uh, this people are getting high and they're getting laid and they're slamming into each other and they're having a great old time and and it, you know you use sorry use the word dignity right and and that's a part of it and the other part is just whatever some other the other parts of of the human experience right which is which is fun and you know I got stuff in my book about the guys who like to go beat up other people right and they weren't Nazis they weren't they weren't skinheads they liked being punks because people were going to attack them for being punks because people would in those days and then they got to fight back. Right? And some of them, and they weren't the fake punks, right? They were, they, they were there right from the beginning, at least in their little world and stuff like that. Um, so some of the richness of that disappears when you ask all the uh, uh, social history questions and sort of quantify it and get all these kind of data. But you can, you can, you can weave it in with the stories as well. Any questions or? fair share of you know, punk rock folks and novels. Last year, a book that came out, this comes out, Murder Zoom, talked about a whole I had never heard, except in maybe passing about this side, way, way back, that anything about punks wanting to like, fight and murder other punks for, you know, sometimes seemingly Um, I mentioned that very briefly in my book, 
right? And do talk about the drugs, but I mean, do talk about drugs and, and violence uh, at, at length, but absolutely it's one of the areas that I would love to go in deeper, right? There's more there and, and um, in terms of, you know, how extensive it was. And I'm not, still not certain how extensive. I know it was there, I talk about it. Uh, violence was absolutely central to, uh, to the culture of hardcore in Southern California, right? And the threat of violence. Generally, it wasn't murderous. Generally, it wasn't with, you know, it wasn't with guns, right? That's a, uh, that's a key distinction for what we know comes later with, with hip hop, right? But there are knives, there are gang fights. Gangs, in my knowledge, are relatively loosely organized as gangs. But, but you know, that story, the, the uh, La Morada Pog fight is, and again, I, I, I got some information on that when I was doing my work, but not, you know, not as much as com is, is in that book. Jack Grisham's book is another good place to sort of see that perspective, and I actually talk about him a lot. Um, and I actually don't, you know, in the bigger story, I'm not sure how influential, right? And that's one of the questions we, you know, historians have to gauge, like how much time and space do you give this one story, how representative of it is. But it was absolutely important enough that it needs to be in there, absolutely, yeah. Be especially because you were talking about the media and how the riot girls said we don't want to talk to the media. And, and the, the, the LA punks had a similar, like, problem with what about the media and the media is creating these stories and, and the myth in, in LA became that the media created all these violent punks um, who saw the violence on Chips and Quincy were the two cop shows <laughs> that, that and the two famous episodes which you can now actually see on YouTube and stuff but um, and it's, it's, you know, it's true that, that they did bring more people in but you know and you can see it in the decline and, and you can see it you know that uh, even before that, some of the, the South Bay punks in particular, violence was what drew them in from the beginning. Discos out, murders in. Discos out, murders in. Okay. Yes, sir. Did you, did you say that hardcore was not the motive? Were you interested in the that, that was Me? Yes, you say that, that I don't think I used the word validate. Um, so I did not make a, con I don't think I made a, a musical judgment or a musical evaluation. I studiously avoided, right? I said la the, the, the quote about there was lots of lousy hardcore but studiously avoided making a, a judgment about its musicality. And again, that's what drew me on one level into this as an object to study. I actually think there is great questions to talk about the aesthetics and, and especially what of that music still holds up, right? Uh, and what doesn't. Certainly the Minutemen does, but they're, they're an outlier. Uh, I think like the perspective I have is that all the, like a lot of the first wave stuff is, um, is people figuring out that they, they can play essentially whatever they want and that there's space for all the weirdos. Uh, you know, there's space for all the kooks who didn't have any other place to fit in. And then, uh, you know, you draw your arbitrary line, 81, 82, and every band begins to sound kind of the same. You know? uh, like, if you like polka, you're going to love hardcore. It's just a 1-2 beat, 2-4 uh, beat. Kids who are like kids who have never worked a job in their lives, you know, yelling about how Reagan's an asshole, and stuff like that. <laughs> sure. You know, I mean, certainly there's like uh, there's exceptions. But and there's an explosion of different types of music. Where right? <laughs> is the other part? Fire you. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to say I think you know it's funny because the Minutemen weren't a hardcore band. Right. By any definition, they were just a South Bay band who ended up on Black Flag label because they were friends. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it, you get into a, the, when you start really trying to break down the, the, you know, the descriptions of this stuff, it gets pretty weird. Um, you know, I mean, they were there at that time and they were certainly playing, but, you know, no, the minimum weren't any, it was just, they were just, that was what they were just doing, what they wanted to do. For me, the distinction was, you know, but they didn't. People didn't like them. You know, hardcore bands didn't like them. I remember seeing them at the first big show they played was uh, Santa Monica Civic in 
81, they were opening for the, they were the fourth bill of adolescence, like the version of the adolescence with Pat Smear on guitar, it was here because Rick Agnew just quit. Um, Black Flag was headlining, I think DOA was the second bill. And uh, the Minutemen opened while they were still sort of like loading stuff in. <laughs> and people fucking hated them. People started throwing like handfuls of change up at them. And Watt and Boom were like scrambling around to like put the change in their pocket. You know, like, hey. <laughs> they were playing to me, like grabbing the change and sticking it in their pocket. And Mugger was running back and forth on stage, like also grabbing change. But people were just like winging, you know, money at them. For, the, for, uh, for a hardcore audience, they were known, you know, it was like when Black Flag would tour, whether they took the Minutemen, Saccharin, you know, they the have the high show, but I mean, it was like, none of these bands were hardcore bands. They opened, there weren't even a local hardcore band that played, but they always were like provocational to people who really wanted a doctrinaire hardcore. So when the formulaic bands come in, if we want to use that word, right, it, it doesn't mean that every band is like that, right? But a whole oh, wave no, comes in. They had, that, they had that robo, you know, like South American one, 4-4-B four, four thing. Right. It was like, but a lot of bands went that direction. I mean, even bands that had been very different, like the Misfits, when robo joins, they see, I mean, they, by the time like Earth AD or something comes up, they're so sped up, you can't hear any of their, they're like riffs the same kind of way. Bands that can, you know, it's just like, it's curious, because the thing is, at the same time, Black Flag, really, after Dead, were kind of not a hardcore band either. Well, for the first period, but, you know, for Damaged, clearly they were, but, but I think the bands often take the lead, especially the ones that have been around, right? By this point, like, you know, the bands are looking like normal people, you know, some, um, and then, and they go into Black Flag, you know, as a provocation, grows their hair long, right, and slows the music down. The middle class who, you know, to my mind, still stand up, you know, and they go in a complete, they bring synthesizers in and things like that. So the bands were very, the ones that had been around were very quickly feeling the straitjacket of, of hardcore. So I, I, you know, I use, we talked before about what is punk, and I, I don't find that a useful question. I think it's all, it's all fine. I, I use the question, you know, the distinction between punk and hardcore, I'm really talking about the distinction between urban and suburban or post-suburban. That is, you know, the city has always been a place for people to come and reinvent themselves, right? The Bohemian Enclave, and Hollywood was that in L.A., but almost from the very beginning and certainly very soon after in L.A., you know, down in the South Bay, down in Huntington Beach, you start, and out in the valley, there are these pockets, and, and that's what my, the question, I was like, well, why didn't they just move to Hollywood like everyone else did, you know? And I went and, and you know, the, the flip side is out in Whittier, Right? And they feel pride that they don't come. They come in for the shows and then they go back. And, and so that, that, that was one of my original questions was why didn't they do that? Everywhere else people go. You, if you're from New Jersey, you go into New York. If you don't move there because you're too young or don't, can't afford it, you, you at least go in for the shows. You weren't expecting any shows in your home in New Jersey. And that fragmentation starts in Southern California. And I, and I discuss it as a part of the, the uniquely fragmented uh, landscape of, of Southern California, but that's duplicated elsewhere as well after, after it's pioneered in, in, in the Southern California. So it's not so much punk hardcore for me as an urban suburban divide. Um, I think we're at the time, so um, maybe we'll just take another break and then we'll have um, Michael Stewart Foley's talk uh, beginning around five.